hearing feedback. No, it's not you. We love technology here. If you've ever been to any of our presentations, you know. And then you then you bring us down to an 1887 chapel and we get to do it all over again. Um, but we are still on Zoom. Um, we are asking you to wear masks, although while we're up here talking, we're going to take those off so you can hear us. Um, please get vaccinated. That's all I'll say about that. Um, I want to say it is right at 630 and I always, if you've heard me do an introduction before, you've heard me say if we start on time, we're late. I had a Navy dad, uh, but mostly I had maybe Uncle Admiral Harry and they're both here today, so I'm glad I started right on time. Um, but I want to welcome you guys all here. It's been a long time since we've had a boardwalk talk in the chapel. If you feel like the AC is from 1887, you are right. Mueller uh, heating and air came out and did a rush job, so it will start to cool down. We're going to keep the door closed as much as possible, just shallow breaths. And if you are smart, you already are sitting over the air conditioning ducts that are about six, six rows back, six feet back. Um, so first of all, I want to say, are there any Beaches Museum members in the building? Please raise your hand. Thank you. We love you. And our Beaches Museum board members. I know Katie and Doris are here. Thank you guys all for your support of the museum. You make everything that we do here possible. And if you're interested in learning more about membership, both of those ladies are also on the membership committee. So look around and they will find you. A couple upcoming events that we have. Um, we are proceeding cautiously with a fall schedule of events, um, but grab a uh, postcard on your way out. This is for train day, it's uh, riding the rails Pablo Beach train day. We're going to start off on September 9th right back here with The Flying Ape, which is a Norman Studios film. It's a silent film, but we will have a musical accompaniment and you will love it. The reason that we picked that uh, particular movie is that, is Bob? is that our Mayport train is actually featured in the movie and Norman Studios is right here in Arlington um, back in the time where we were really the Hollywood of the South. So it'll be really an interesting movie, a lot of fun. And then on September 11th, which is the Saturday, it's when we have the community kind of family friendly event all out here throughout the park. So we encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, it's a very good time. Um, we are also about to start a brand new partnership with the Florida Chamber Music Project. Um, is anyone familiar with that group? They had previously done concerts down at the um, Ponte Vedra Concert Hall, but they're moving up here to the chapel. They want to be a little more centrally located. And who can really beat this beautiful building um, for chamber music? So that will start on September 12th. So right after train day, we roll right into to that event. So we're excited to partner with them. And then, of course, down at the museum, we have our exhibit in partnership with the Timaquan Parks Foundation uh, called Celebrate and Explore Our Wilderness Parks. And I thought I knew a lot of parks that we had here in our area, and I had no idea the depth of the beautiful natural uh, parks that we have um, all throughout Northeast Florida. So come and check it out. It's a wonderful exhibit, features the beautiful artwork of Kathy Stark and the photography of Will Dickey, who's here, and Tom Schipanella, who I don't think is here, um, but you will not be disappointed uh, if you come out and explore that as, um, exhibit. And I think it'll be open until October, November. We haven't figured out the exact takedown date, so don't miss it. It's gonna be a moving target. You wanna come and check it out. So I'm really delighted to, into, oh, sorry. I forgot the most important thing. The bathrooms are in the cabin, so down the stairs, up the ramp, they're there. It's nice and cool in the cabin, crisp 72 degrees if you need to cool off a little bit. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Mark Woods. He's been, you may know him as a Florida Times Union columnist, which he's columnist, which he's been doing since 2001. Um, but really um, where I started paying a lot of attention was when he took a year uh, traveling across national parks. So he started on the East Coast, ended as far west as you could go in Hawaii, um, and chronicled um, that journey and discovering our, our country's national parks. I will say I did take a sneak peek at his um, presentation. January 1 in Acadia, which is in Maine. And I just came back from Acadia and I was there in July. And I, every, the whole time I'm there, I'm like, I never want to be here in the winter. It looks really cold. So kudos to you for starting there. Uh, but he's documented his trip and ultimately wrote a book, which is conveniently also for sale. Some of us already got it. Uh, but it'll be outside on the patio uh, at the end of the of the evening. So I'm happy to uh, introduce. Oh wait, one more thing. This was the fourth in our lecture series that goes along with um, 
with the Timaquan Parks Foundation uh, exhibit. So we're really thankful to them for bringing us not only a wonderful exhibit, but also this, this wonderful programming that we're gonna wrap up today with Mark Wood. Take it away. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can you hear me back there? Is the microphone working? All right, all right. Uh, yeah, thanks to the Beach Museum and Timaquan Parks Foundation, you know, two organizations we're definitely lucky to have here in Northeast Florida. So I have to start there. Um, I think somebody already asked me tonight, how do you get to have a year in the National Parks? So maybe that's where I should start off with how, how I got to have that. Um, and it was hit me the other day, it was almost 10 years ago. It was um, the summer of 2011. And um, these emails have popped into my inbox about this fellowship, this Eugene C. Pulliam Fellowship, which is awarded to um, one journalist each year. And I didn't even really pay attention to it the first few times. It was just like, here's more junk email. But, I don't, I, but at one point, I stopped and I read this, and I thought, OK. Um, I don't know, maybe I should apply for this uh, and give it a shot. And um, uh, I thought about what would I, basically to give somebody the, the freedom to have a sabbatical year and pursue kind of a dream assignment. And I thought, what would I do for a dream assignment? I looked at the previous winners and they were all very meaty topics. Think of anything that's still in the news today, whether it's you know some world strife or, um, poverty or violence or whatever. There were, there were things that I thought, I'm not sure I want to immerse myself in for a year. If I had a year off, and I don't know, I'd want to travel to the national parks and thought, but they'll never give me a fellowship for that. Um, but then it hit me, 2016 was going to be the centennial of the National Park Service. And um, kind of thanks to Ken Burns, it was kind of on the radar of people, I think. And um, I thought, well, Ken Burns and John Muir and all these Ansel Adams, people have beautifully documented the history of the National Parks. That wasn't really worthy of this fellowship, but what if I pitched it as, what's gonna happen in the next 100 years? Um, so I waited till the last minute and sent off this proposal and thought I'll never win and didn't hear anything for a few months. And then late in 2011, I got a call from the um, chair of the, the award committee and said, um, that's what, it was a voice and I thought, well, this is good. Maybe I'm in the mix or something. I called him back and said, well, you're, you're our winner. You have, a, you have this fellowship for the next year. So all of a sudden I had this year in the parks and people instantly said, um, said, do you need somebody to carry your bag? Do <laughs> uh, you need somebody to take pictures? I think Will might have said that. Uh, uh, people were volunteering to, to tag along. And then the other thing they would do is say, you have to go to such and such. How, how many folks here have been to a national park? Um, so you probably do what I do when you get back and tell people you have to go to such and such a place. So everybody was telling me that, that you need to go to their, their favorite park. And I would explain that um, my goal wasn't to go to the, the, all the parks. At that point, there was uh, 60 national, the big ones that we think of, and there were about 400 national park service units like we have in our backyard, Tim Conn Preserve is one of those, and, and Cumberland Island National Seashore, and Castilla to San Marcos. Um, the goal wasn't to go to all 400, it was to pick 12, one a month, and have each one symbolize something different for the future. That was kind of my project plan. So um, I'm gonna kind of walk you through that year, and some of you know that it didn't, it, it had some, Things happened that um, changed the year for me, and I'll, I'll talk about that as I go through it. But yeah, I started in Acadia. Let's see if I can do this. Maybe. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, Helps I can stand by the laptop and just do that. Well, I'll start in, as Chris said, I started in a Acadia National Park in Maine. Um, and yes, it's kind of crazy, January 1 uh, in Maine. Um, the reason I chose that was because the place that 
first sunrise in America each year where it hits is Cadillac Mountain. So I liked the symbolism of this is the start of a new year in America um, atop Cadillac Mountain. And I called up to Acadia and the Friends group up there, their version of Tim Park Arts Foundation, and asked, is there anybody that starts the year um, top Cadillac Mountain? And they said, oh yeah, our, our past president, Lily Pugh, she, she goes up there every year. And um, she, she starts the year there. And so I contacted Lily and said, can I start the year with you there? So that's what I did. So this is um, January 1, top Cadillac Mountain. Okay. That's Lily and Carol. Um, and they, it was so foggy. I don't know if it was like that when you went there, Chris, but it's often foggy there. So you don't get, but it was thick, thick, thick. And it was kind of turned everything pink so much so that we had to know what time sunrise was. We didn't really go by the sunlight. It's almost like we know it's going to like what you do at New Year's Eve. It's 742, it's going to rise. So People counted it down 10, 9, 8, um, but it eventually kind of poked up and it kind of lit up the sky and come, turned the rocks. Rocks are always already this pinkish granite, kind of turned them even more pink. And they were all apologizing for, oh, we're sorry to get beautiful sunrise. I said, we get those on our beach all the time. And this is this is a memorable way to start the year. And I, I meant that. It was just, it felt kind of surreal up there. Um, and we, we had mountain biked in the dark wearing headlamps and we mountain back back down past in the summer that would be waterfalls and in the winter it was um it was ice falls uh, so february i went to swallow national park in tucson arizona i think partly to thaw out from <laughs> january in maine um did you bike all the way there no no <laughs> um and partly because of the saguaro cactus. Um, I wanted to think about some piece of vegetation for the future, to symbolize the future of the parks, what's gonna happen with, and there's only a handful of parks that are named for their vegetation. I think it's um, Redwood, Joshua Tree, um, Saguaro, um, Oregon Pike. There's, there's a handful that are named for the vegetation, but I've always loved the saguaro. Um, it's kind of a symbol of the West, but it's really only in a, a small portion of the West. Um, I, think, I'll, I kind of like the stat in Tucson. I think there's, I think they say there's about a million swarrows and about a million people. So one to one ratio. Um, so that's part of the reason I went there. The other was because that's where my mom was, where she, after my, my dad died in 1996 and she retired there. And um, she made me and my two sisters fall in love with the parks. Um, I fall in love with Saguaro National Park in the desert. And the reason I love the parks is my, because of my parents. I think that was one of the lessons of the year was kind of you, we pass along these places from generation to generation as a, as a country, but also as families. Um, and the reason I love the parks is because my mom and dad were taking us there as kids. Um, and the day I arrived there, my mom, the day before, had gone into the hospital. She wasn't feeling well. She was one of the healthiest 70-something-year-olds I knew. She would, whenever we visited, she would wear us out the hikes that she'd do. Um, so I was a little concerned, but not too concerned. Um, but checked on her that day after I met with the Parks and Park Service folks, and she said the doctor just came in and said uh, I didn't have months to live. My first reaction was that can't be right. So healthy that anything, this must be wrong. Um, but they said she had a rare, kind of basically inoperable cancer and had months to live. Um, so that instantly changed what the year felt like to me. Um, for my first reaction was that this project, this kind of grand assignment, felt pretty meaningless. Um, Pretty quickly after that, it, it kind of morphed into it felt even more meaningful. Because um, I, as I said, that my mom is the reason I love the parks, my mom and dad. And um, so I felt like, and she was so excited that I was doing this. And she wanted me to continue on the year. And I did, although I tweaked some of the plans. Uh, I stayed more in the 
Southwest, I was going to, oh, I should have given you that picture before that's my, of my mom and dad. Um, I'm not even sure when that is, um, but I always say I think it's before kids because they look too too relaxed, too happy. Um, that's one of my favorite pictures of them. I'll, I'm not even sure where it is or when it is, but I love that picture of the two of them. Um, and that's, we would, you know, our summers would be spent on these kind of epic long road trips of pulling this trailer behind it. And my, my dad was a Baptist minister, but when he was setting up that trailer, there were a lot of swear words. You know, so, like the, the dad in the, uh, in a Christmas uh, story, fighting with the furnace in the basement, that was like one. So that's part of my memory of whenever I see that, that uh, camp pop up camp with my dad fighting to get it up. But then once it was a, once it was set up, everything was good. Um, that's, I have two sisters, and I guess mom decided we got, she got a deal on yellow slickers or something. <laughs> um, and this was Redwood National Park, which was, I think, one of my first national parks I went to. And shortly after I went to the fellowship, we went there that right prior to this year. And at the time, I had no idea it would be the last trip I'd do with my mom. So when people ask me what's my favorite national park, one of the ones I bring up is Redwood. And I think whenever I ask it, others, you know, often is what what beauty is there, but it's also the experience you have. You, I went with so-and-so, this loved one, I went with my parents, I went with my kids. And I think that's kind of the, the magic of the National Park. So I can, I can go back to that spot and stand in front of that tree and it's probably going to look exactly the same. If I go back to my hometown, I have to walk around and say, this is what used to be here, that's what used to be there. And that's the magic of the, the National Park. Um, so in March, I went to Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, uh, which is when the Colorado River comes down before it reaches the Grand Canyon, it's Glen Canyon. Um, and there's Glen Canyon Dam. So I, was, I wanted to think in terms of water. That was the, the original plan. I was thinking one of the future in the West. In fact, there's been stories in the past week about how they've had to cut back on water. Um, that was kind of what I was trying to explore at that point. I um, was thinking in terms of water in the West um, and using the Colorado River. And that was kind of the journalistic academic thing, but I found throughout this now there's this thread often of my, my family, my parents, my mom. She and I rafted the um, Colorado River through, um, through Canyon Lands National Park down to Glen Canyon um, shortly after her 70th birthday. Um, she was doing trips with separate trips to each, each child. So if you told me when I was a teenager I was going to do a vacation with my mom, I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> but it was, the, it was a wonderful trip with her. So we had this amazing experience um, rafting the Colorado River. And I spent a weekend with all these river guys. Uh, they, you know, when they have a vacation, I mean, a convention, they don't go to the, the Marriott in Phoenix. They go out to this spot. Uh, and this, I don't know if you can see it, it pops them up, but this is the night skies. But well, these are the last couple bridges, Navajo Bridge, there's an old and a new one. And then there's no man-made structure over the Colorado River for 200 some miles, basically through the Grand Canyon, which was my next stop. So I kind of continued down the Colorado River, um, partly because that's the other one. When people ask me your favorite parks, Grand Canyon I've been to probably more than any other park other than our local parks or Saguaro National Park where my mom backed up to. Um, that's a park I keep going back to again and again. It feels almost spiritual. Probably, like I said, my dad was a, a minister, but I think sometimes a place like this feels as spiritual or more so than you know, the chapel. That's what I think he would have said. Um, and the Grand Canyon is just an amazing spot. Um, so I hiked down to the river and on the way there, um, bumped into this family and there's this, this little boy that is going down to the river too and his name is Blue, or at least that's what they called him. When I got close, I saw he had the bluest eyes I've ever seen. And um, he was so excited to be hiking down to the, to the river. He kept saying, I'm going down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I thought if I'm looking for the future of the national parks, I could do worse than a, a boy named Blue. Bottom of the river. Um, I wanted to include one Florida park. 
market. You know, I thought about our backyard parks, I thought about Everglades, but I've always, I'd always wanted to go to the Dry Tortugas, um, you know, about 70 miles off Key West. Um, it, it's, it's a little collection of seven islands that are, their total land for those seven islands, I think is less than 100 acres, and it's a 100 square mile park, so it's almost all water. So it's almost the antithesis of where I just came from, um, where you have the Colorado River, a little band of water through this dry, arid southwest climate. Here you have little pieces of land amidst all this water, tropical water. And it's also this place that um, feels almost like a setting out of a novel. It's, uh, it has shipwrecks and pirates and this um, massive fort, one of the largest forts America ever built out here. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think of our, um, the miracle of the time I grew up ascending a man to the moon. Um, the previous century, this feels like one of those miracles. How they managed to build this fort with 16 million bricks, I think it was that, out on this little island, 70 miles from Key West. And, and engineers still marvel at its construction. You know, it survived all these hurricanes. And in fact, the, the park rangers they, they say, you know, if you're going to be hit by a hurricane in the Keys, the one place you want to be probably is in that that um, spot. So you take a ferry out to. Let's see the video. Probably I don't think plays, but you take it out there. Um, and part of what I was trying to think about was I wanted one part to be about climate change, and that's why I thought about the Everglades. Some people said Everglades is ground zero, but if that's true. This is probably below ground zero because the highest point on the seven. Um, seven islands is something like 10 feet. And um, the, the rangers talk about how the moat there around it, it's gradually the water and there, even in a couple of decades, they've watched it come up on it and that it never used to lap over it, but now it is. And um, so now the fort and needs a lot of repairs and that's one of the park services dilemma for the next hundred years. Do we invest in repairing, you know, tens of millions of dollars of a cost to um, fix something that we feel like may not be above water that long. So I, I wanted to camp up there. You can camp up there. You, can not, you go out a lot of times go for the day, but you can camp up there. Um, and it was, um, I took a picture of the book that when you get off the ferry, it said, I'm not going to say it in French, but it was signed, signed, signed by somebody from France. And um, what that translates to is paradise on earth. God bless America, they wrote. Um, and when it, one thing that struck me throughout the year was whenever I'd bump into, um, end up talking to foreign visitors, they'd talk about, do Americans realize what you have? They'd say, um, you know, if you want to have a contest about cathedrals, we'll, we'll bring it on, we'll, we'll try and, we think we can beat you on that, and, you know, the historic buildings and things, you, you think your, uh, whatever, 1800 churches is old, you know, we have 14, 13. They said, we don't have national parks. Like you have. Um, do, you, do Americans realize that? And I, I tell them I think a lot of Americans do, but a lot of Americans don't realize what we have as far as our parks. And that's kind of one of the, the big concerns I think for the future is we have to appreciate these places and protect them. Um, June went to Yellowstone National Park. Partly um, it's, it's the world's first national park created in 1872. So I felt like it was kind of obligatory. Um, I wasn't really all that excited about going because my memories of it from being a kid, I can, all the other national parks from my childhood that I went to as a kid, I can remember it so vividly. I mean, I can picture campsites in the Redwoods. I can picture going to the Grand Canyon. I couldn't remember that much about Yellowstone. I at one point asked my mom in, and said, why don't I remember Yellowstone? And she said, well, we, Zipped through there, saw a faithful around, and it was on a long cross country trip. So we basically did the kind of bucket list check it off. Um, so I think the moral to that story is if you if you just do that, yes, you you made it there, you saw somewhere. But if you spend more than an hour somewhere, you spend a whole day, or if you spend two weeks like you did this time, it creates a different impression. And it, I mean, it's a, an amazing national park. It's not just our first. It's it has a little bit of everything. You know, it obviously has the um, it has the uh, geothermal features like Old Faithful, but it has dozens of waterfalls. It has some of the most amazing wildlife that you'll see in any national park. It has 
Um, so it, it is truly one of the, um, and that's one of the reasons I went there was to try and think in terms of uh, pick out one form of wildlife to think of. The bison, largest mammal in North America, once upon a time there were millions of them roaming the West, and there was this, and Yellowstone was full of them. And uh, but this this herd, prehistoric herd, was down to about a dozen um, a century ago, and now it's one of the great conservation stories of, of America that it's it's come back so much so that there's now so many bison in, in Yellowstone that um, the issue is what to do about them when they leave the park because there's no mountains, not a fence there. So that's what I went there to kind of write about there. Um, but this was a one trip my family went with there. My, my daughter was in elementary school there and we were setting up a tent. She said, Daddy, there's a, there's a bison out, out front. And I thought, are you sure? Because she, she always played these jokes like, I got, I got an F on a test today. And she said, just kidding. So I thought that's what she was doing with the bison, poked my head outside the tent, and then that's what I saw. Um, that was the first bison we see. If you've been there, you, you see them everywhere. I mean, you end up... Uh, that was a video I wish I could play because it walks right, it creates a bison jam. Um, so that was the one, I said, the one trip my daughter went with me. Uh, while I was there, I called my sister, my, one of my sisters in Tucson, and, uh, my family flew back to Jacksonville and I was going to fly back and my sister said, I think you better come to Tucson. My mom's health, you know, she was diagnosed in February, had deteriorated very, very quickly. Um, she died June 30th of, of that year, um, which to me felt somewhat symbolic the exact midpoint of the year. It felt like um, for me, the year was split into two parts. The first half was knowing that I was losing her the second half was how do you move on after losing somebody? And you know, we all grieve and answer those questions different ways. For me, the parks were a key part of both pieces of that equation because um, I feel like they're a connection to her, a connection to my dad. Um, when she was dying, she said she didn't want a big service in, a, in the church. She went, went to church every Sunday, but she said for whatever reason she didn't so we kind of honored that. We did not have a big service in the church. We had a service at Swarrow National Park where she volunteered. Had one outside at sunrise one day. Um, this is the back of the visitor center there um, where she volunteered. And um, the, the pastor had a, my mom was a quiet person. She said, oh, let's, let's have a moment of silence. We went through a little hike through the desert and just listened to the desert, I think my mom that. So then, yes, I'm trying to continue this year. Um, when I started, I should have said there was one trip my mom was going to do with me. In, in July, we were going to go to Denali National Park. She'd never been to Denali. Really wanted to go. I was going to include that at one Alaska Park. Um, I just kind of decided I wasn't up for it. I wasn't ready to do that trip without her. Kind of went the complete opposite. I wanted to include one urban park. In the, in the year, because um, the Park Service mission for the centennial was, they talked about how in the first century they brought people to the parks, in the second century they wanted to bring parks to the people, and they wanted to improve their urban parks. And um, they, somebody from the National Parks Conservation Association said, you should go to Gateway in New York. Um, Golden Gate National Recreation Area and Gateway in New York were both created the same year, 1972. They told me Golden Gate is kind of this model for her park. Gateway is a, a mess. I said, well, that's that's an interesting pitch for why I should go to, to Gateway. Um, they said, no, it's 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 there's been issues of they've had some mismanagement and it hasn't had the buy-in like from the city like San, San Francisco has had at Golden Gate has had in San Francisco, but it has so much potential. It's um 27,000 acres. There's um, there's this Floyd Bennett field that they want to have the largest campground in urban America. And from Floyd Bennett field, you actually can see Manhattan. So I said, I could camp in New York City. And so I said, that sounds, that sounds interesting. So I, that had me hooked. Uh, so, that, so I went there um, to Gateway. Now, I don't know if you can see, it says uh, campgrounds to the, to the right, NYC's Annotation Training Center. 
same direction. <laughs> which is when I start to realize, what, what did I get myself into here? Um, it's Floyd Bennett Field was New York City's first municipal airport. And I think they had, if I remember right, broke ground right before uh, Black Friday and the Great Depression. Yeah. So it almost feels cursed from the get go. But in the 1920s, it kind of had this glory area of all these um, famous flights, uh, including like Broadway, um, Corrigan. And um, it had uh, um, this brief window where it was successful. And then it kind of, it was hard to get to then. It's hard to get to now. And it never really succeeded. So it became in World War II, our, the busiest airport for the military. But then after that, it went quiet again. 1972 handed to the National Park Service. So they're trying to figure out what to do with it ever, ever since, pretty much. So it has this massive amount of tarmac. There's the training, training the NMIC sanitation training center. The campground is right across there from where those trees are. Um, that's, my, that's my tent there. What I wish you could feel is it's heat probably as hot or hotter than what we're having now. The worst mosquitoes of the of anywhere I had, much worse than Yellowstone. And first night I'm in my tent, every 30 seconds feels like there's a jet flying about 10 feet above the tent. Just, um, and that's because LaGuardia is just across to Jamaica Bay. Now it turns out that was partly the air, the, the pattern for that night, the weather or something that wasn't like that every night. The first night I'm lying there thinking. What am I? What am I getting myself into? Here's here's the RV. It seems even more bleak just on the tarmac. There's one of the old hangers. Um, so I'm starting to think I could be in whatever Glacier National Park or whatever. But this is one of the head right now. Interpretive rangers tell me let's go to went to this place called Bottle Beach. He said you'll you'll see why when we get there. Uh, a landfill is broken and. All these bottles have washed up that looked kind of vintage early 1900s. Um, but eventually, I spent some time with the head ranger there, and he's talked about how he grew up in Brooklyn. And every day he drives to work and he wishes this place existed. He said it's not just, yes, it had a lot of potential, but it already is an amazing place. Um, here's one of the hangers that converted basically back to kind of its former glory. It's now the visitor center. Um, Another hangar has been restored. He took me out into that, that trees back there in the campground, but he took me back in this, this field and he, he was gushing about how amazing it was. And he said, you don't see it, do you? Uh, I said, no. Nah. He said, you just see a bunch of weeds. I said, yeah, I have to admit, that's not what I see. And um, he said, let's get out of the car. He was, he was off that day, he wasn't in his uniform, um, kind of tromped through and he was showing me all Look at this flower, look at this. This is brought back such and such a bird. He said, this isn't, isn't Yellowstone or Yosemite, but this is a piece of New York City like it was 200 years ago. Um, and it's restored this, this area. And so I feel like that week, I think about that week a lot when I went kayaking in Jamaica Bay and to be out in the middle of this water in New York City, now still had airplanes flying overhead. Um, and a landfill off to the distance, but it is a pretty amazing place. Now, um, it made me think about um, appreciating, it, it made me appreciate the places we have in our backyard and, and how important it is to preserve these urban parks, like what we have. Um, from there, I went to Yosemite in August, and that one I wanted to think about um, kind of the idea of loving our parks to death. You go to Yosemite Valley in August, and it's one of the most crowded places, but I purposefully went there. But I didn't really want to think about um, traffic patterns or that kind of crowding. That seemed too boring to write about. Or, or, so I went to El Capitan and talked to rock climbers and wrote about, tried to write about rock climbing. Because 100 years ago, nobody was looking at El Capitan and saying, I'm going to climb that. Now, at this point, um, Alex Honnold, there was questions, would he try and free so low? Without ropes, and of course he did, and that became the Oscar award-winning uh, documentary a couple of years ago. Um, but now there's actually literally traffic jams on El Capitan, um, and that's more with my feet being spectator <laughs> watching people do it. Um, I talked to the head head climbing ranger there. That's one of the jobs there, head climbing ranger. 
while we were talking about modern behind this. Uh, uh, then I went up to Half Dome. I did not climb the face of Half Dome, but there's, you know, if you can see, there's cables that go up the side and they go about a 45 degree angle. And that, to the real rock climbers, that would be boring, like a jungle gym or the playground. But to me, that was daunting enough. Um, so up atop Half Dome, which is probably one of the most famous you know, rock formations in the world. I did not get that close to the edge. Um, somebody had written that at the top, it ain't easy. Uh, but that was a memorable, that was a memorable trip. From there, I went to um, Flight 93 National Memorial, which I'm actually going to back to this month. I've been there several times. When I won the fellowship, that was one place I knew I wanted to include. Uh, I want, you know, our parks are about history, American history. Um, and I thought about going to, you know, Gettysburg, Antietam, all these places that have a little bit more amazing American history. But I really want to do Flight 93 because it's history that all of us remember. But 100 years from now, that place will be telling the story of Flight 93. Um, so it's a new national park. And how do you create a new national park? I found that idea intriguing. But the other reason was um, Richard Rudaka. Um, Richard's sister, Lori, was here at the beach. Her, um, Richard's dad and mom, her, his mom has passed away, but his dad is now, I believe, 95. Um, and so I've gone to Flight 93 with, Richard, uh, with Richard's family several times. Now they keep telling me I'm part of the family. I'm going this year with them. Uh, so I wanted to tell Richard's story. He, um, that's Lori, his sister. Richard was a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Director, so he was a Department of Interior employee. He was the only Department of Interior employee on the plane. So now this land is you know, Department of Interior land. And Lori talks about how when she first went there, um, she hated the place. It was, she never wanted to go back again. Because I don't know if you remember what it was before the flight crashed, or it's basically this abandoned strip mine. And she talks about showing up there, not only is it the place where this plane crashed and the brother died, but it just was, she said it was stripped bare of everything good. There was no, no trees, no wildlife, nothing. It just felt so bleak. Um, but now, it's, you know, it's a 2,000 acre park, and uh, this is a rock that marks the spot where the plane crashed. And most of the park is open to the public. That is not, that's kind of like a sacred spot for the family members, all the family members can go back there. Um, but Lori talks about how nature has come back, has taken back these 2,000 acres. This is one of the rangers does a whole talk about that, how many of the passengers had ties to nature. One was a landscape architect. One was a lawyer who sued basically to fight for environmental causes. And one of his lawsuits, of all things, was against the National Park Service. So there's a certain irony there. Um, trying to make the Park Service do even more than it was at a, a park in California, if I remember correctly. And then there was Richard, who was a, a, a ranger. Um, so this ranger does a story about Richard, includes Richard in his story. And Lori talks about, it's another one where it isn't, uh, you know, it isn't Yosemite or Yellowstone, but it has its own beauty. And um, for me personally, it was here I was grieving and I, as I, it was a place that helped me kind of process that. I, you know, I told Lori, I got to say goodbye to my mom and my dad. She she never had that. You know, she wakes up one day and she's looking at pictures of planes crashing into the Twin Towers, and um, it's like the rest of us for real. That had no idea that day. Later, she'll realize the brother was on the flight that was crashed in the field. So being meeting other passengers families this place is a pretty profound pretty special place so if you're ever driving through pennsylvania i would say to go there it's um, what they've created with the wall but also the natural landscape it's a very very memorable spot october i went to olympic national park in near outside of seattle and i went there to think about the sound there's a, a guy, Gordon Hempton. He uh, 
he um, has won Emmys for recording natural sound, and he calls himself the sound tracker. And his whole mission is to preserve places, quiet places. He says there's only um, something like a dozen places where you can go 15 minutes without hearing man-made sound during the day. And when he first told me that, I thought, that's, there's no way that's true. I can go to a lot of places. But he kind of cursed, cursed me. Once you hear that, you go somewhere, try and go 15 minutes without hearing man-made sound. It's very, very difficult. But he says the whole rainforest in Olympic National Park is one of those places. So he created this spot that he calls the one square inch of silence. And its mission is to promote trying to create um, this, this, this place where you preserve natural sound. So if a plane, he goes there and a plane flies overhead, he records the decibel level, he writes a letter to the airline, and he, his mission is to create this first park where planes go around it and it's a natural soundscape. Um, you know, I don't know that that will ever happen, but I like his, like his thinking. Um, when I was in Yellowstone, um, my mom had this camper van, which was one of her prized possessions that she bought, and she drove it to Jacksonville a few times. She asked if any of us, if her kids wanted those, and we all said, we don't have, our garages are packed full as it is, we don't have space. Um, but when I was in Yellowstone, I was thinking about it, I was looking around at camper vans, and I thought, I think I, think I want that camper van that my mom had. So I called in June and called my sister and said, I tell mom I want the camper van. This is, by this point, my mom wasn't doing very well, but my sister told my mom and she got a big smile. I think happy that it was going to be cheap. So in November, I had to get it back from Tucson to Jacksonville. So I flew there with my whole family. Our family was gathered. My, one of my sisters lives in Detroit. The other lives in Nevada. We all gathered in um, Tucson to celebrate and to scatter my mom's ashes. And and then the next day we gathered. I got on the road. My family members flew back. One of my friends, Chris Burns, um, volunteered to ride back with me. I said, you sure you want to do that? So we did that. Um, first day we got to El Paso, Texas, and first night, and I called my wife and said, we're going to, um, I think we're just going to stay at this Holiday Inn here. She said, you have a camper van. You're going to stay at the Holiday Inn? I said, yeah, but I don't think there's anywhere to camp here. But she kind of shamed me into trying to find someplace. All we could find was there was a Walmart there. <laughs> so, yeah, Chris said, I'm up for it, let's do it. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be part of the adventure. So we decided to camp there. I should have told, as I told you, we flew in for Thanksgiving. So I hadn't thought this out. We camped in the Walmart on the Friday after Thanksgiving. <laughs> so it was pretty chaotic. Black Friday in a Walmart. Uh, so it was noisy, it was, uh, but you know, Got up in the middle of night, these restroom, just walked into Walmart in my pajamas. <laughs> um, so hopefully I made up for that the next night when we stopped at Big Bend National Park. We detoured way off um, I-10, or you know, taking I-10 all the way back. Even though you know Big Bend's in one of the most populous states, Texas, it's one of the least visited national parks just because you you have to really want to get there. It's very far south, all the way to the Rio Grande, basically the you know, the Mexico border. Um, and this is Chiso Space, a, a spot that's surrounded by mountains, and it is it is stunning. And somewhere, somewhere down there is the camper van. So hopefully, I made up to Chris for the Walmart experience with uh, camping in Chiso Space. Um, stopped stopped at Gulf Islands National Seashore on the way back too. Camped there, and what I always remember about there was when we got out, um, the smell and it smelled. The marsh it smells similar to what going to out to Round Marsh here or uh, Fort Fort Carolina. I thought I'm getting close to home. I'm getting home close to Jacksonville. Um, and it, it made me think. You know, the last month made me think about sounds. Another obviously smells are a huge part of the piece of the beauty of the place. I made it back home. But, when I started the year, when I had this whole project, even when I had it all kind of mapped out before my mom's illness, I never knew where I was going to finish. It. That was this one, I couldn't figure out what felt right. Um, and I, at the end of the year, as it was going on, I thought, well, should I go back full circle to Acadia? Should I go to, Den I thought about Denali in honor of my mom going to Denali. But I thought I started January 1 in Maine. I'm not sure I want to finish December 31st in Alaska. Um, 
Uh, but at some point, somebody had said to me, well, you start with the sunrise in, in May. Are you going to finish with the sunset in Hawaii? I kind of laughed about it, and I started thinking about it. Like, well, maybe. And I looked at, there's um, Hawaii volcanoes. I looked at, I looked at some of the national parks there, but then I looked at Haleakala, which this 10,000 foot summit, this giant dormant volcano that dominates the island of Maui. Um, it became, you know, it's, Haleakala means house of the sun. Um, it became a national park in 1961, the, the year I was born near my, I'm the oldest of three, um, the same week I was born. So it became, um, the week my parents became parents, it became a national park. So there was that. There was, um, it has some of the darkest night skies in America. There's telescopes, giant telescopes up at the top. It has, the crater is considered one of the quietest places on earth. Not quiet like the whole rainforest, like an Olympic, because that has all this natural sound. This is almost void of sound, eerily quiet. It has all these um, endangered species. It has, anyway, it started to feel, already was feeling like, well, this maybe is a place. And then I read the story behind Haleakala, where the, the local mythology, um, the demigod Maui, this little boy Maui, um, his mother had said, I don't have enough time to get all my chores done during the, during the day. So Maui climbed up to the top of the volcano and um, he made a lasso out of his, these, these branches. And when the sun, sun came overhead, he lassoed the sun and he pulled it down. And he told the sun, I'm only going to let you go if you promise to slow down when you pass overhead of this, of this mountain. And, <coughs> and the sun agreed. So that's the local mythology. So I thought, OK, a boy lassoing the sun for his mother to try and extend the day. Feels like this is the place I was meant to go. <laughs> also, as much as I love my job, um, I kind of didn't want this year to end. I kind of wanted it to drag on a little bit longer. Um, so I love the idea of just kind of this day that went on and on and on. So that's where I went to end the year, was to, uh, you can see the vehicle there. This gives you a sense that you're above the cloud. Uh, Mark, Mark Twain went there when he was a very young man and wrote about me. Even when he's an old man, he talked about how he still had these dreams and visions of Haleakala, how it was um, a, a spectacle like anything, unlike anything he'd ever seen. Um, and most people go there for sunrise. Um, so I did go to a couple sunrises, but I mainly went there for a sunset. I, I camped down in the crater on December 30th, so I woke up December 31st there, and it was surreal how quiet it was. They, what I could hear laying in my tent was my heart beating in my ear. That's how quiet it was. Um, and, and then the stars were unlike any stars I think I saw all year. So it was this kind of sensory overload. Um, then I went back up for there for sunset and it did feel like the sun lingered, like it, the longest sunset I've ever felt. And you know, as opposed to that first year starting in the fog, here it was clear skies, not only clear skies, above the clouds, this long sunset, um, it just felt like it lingered and lingered and lingered. Um, and I took comfort in standing there knowing the sun was headed on its way back to Acadia in a few hours that um, Lily and Carol, the two women from the beginning, they would be greeting it there. Um, so that, was my year in the parks, and that's how it became title of the book, Last Wing of Sun. So, thank you very much for having me. So I'm, I'm so glad that we have you here today. Um, we'll take a couple of questions, and then Mark is going to go outside onto the patio, which is cooler than it is in here. <laughs> um, and he has his books, and he will—you uh, can buy one, and he'll sign a copy for you to take home.
But I want to take a quick moment and recognize Jen Bedley, who is our unsung hero of, um, of COVID era, because Jen started with the Beaches Museum as our marketing education manager in January, mid-January 2020. So if you have not done an event mm -hmm. at the chapel since she's been on staff uh, for more than a year and a half. So this is her first time, but she immediately uh, became Zoom expert and has been doing just such a great job troubleshooting and everything for us. So thank you, Jen. <laughs> it's, 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 it's an interesting time and we've learned a lot. So does anybody have any questions for Mark about his presentation or yes, me? Yeah, she asked, do they still ride their bicycles up to the volcano? Yes, they have. Um, although most of them, what the tour groups do is they drive up there, they drive a tour right bus up there, people get their bikes and they ride down. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're still doing that. Yep. It makes it key about Haleakala because uh, Acadia for me was sunny and happy and sunny, but Haleakala was foggy. So, yeah. you have to go with a very open mind and yeah. just. Not, no expectation. No doubt. Yes. What was the weather at Heliopolis when you were uh, It was very chilly because you're up, you're up pretty high, even though you're in Hawaii. I, I knew that ahead of time, so I brought a down coat and uh, you know, had a down sleeping bag. And but yeah, people people go there to watch sunrise. There's all these stories that they you know, they're in shorts and flip flops because they're in <laughs> Hawaii. In Hawaii. <laughs> and guess what? At ten thousand feet, even in Hawaii, it's it's and before sunrise, it is very, very chilly. It's a, I, forget, I think in the mornings it was, I think it was like in the 30s. It was not, not shorts and flip flop weather. Yeah. Any well, other questions? Between National Park, we can go home and get different gear for the next one, and then after the second one, the home for the third one. Right. The question is, did I did I go home between parks? As, as tempting as it was to just take off and hit the road for a year. And then when, uh, my, my wife was still working, my daughter was in school, I didn't think I should just disappear on them for a year. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, what I did was I would go somewhere for a week or two, spend pretty much immerse myself in, in one park instead of trying to hit a bunch and feel, try and learn as much as I could about that park. And then I'd come home, my plan was I thought, okay, I'll do that, come home, transcribe my interviews, write, I'll have that chapter done, that chapter, end of the year, the book will be all done. End of the year, I had, I had written almost nothing. So, <laughs> and part of that was my mom's illness, but part of that was I didn't really realize how, what an undertaking it was gonna be. So it took me basically four more years for the book to get out, just in time for 2016 the Centennial, so it was five years ago this, this year that it came out. Um, but so yeah, that's how I did it. So I did it. A lot of a lot of flying, uh, so I flew to most of them. Um, obviously not right to two weeks. I drove down there and took the ferry. Um, but yeah, so I, the biggest expenditure that year probably was a lot of plane tickets because I tried to camp, probably partly to stretch the fellowship grant as far as I could, partly because I felt um, I wanted to experience the park from a camping perspective. That I did a lot of that as a kid, and I got away from it. And I felt like if, I, if I'm literally sleeping outside, I'll, I'll experience the park in a different way, which I'm glad I did that. But it was also part of just uh, saving the lodging costs. Yes. I, uh, I recorded, I think I had more than 100 hours of audio, which was both life saving and probably almost killed me transcribing it a couple of years later. I, but it, it helped me. I, so, most of my interviews, I, I didn't want to do them if I was talking to a ranger about some subject. I didn't want to just sit in his office. I said, Can we go for a hike? So, you know, I'd record the interview. I wouldn't try and write on you know, notes while I, was, I just recorded. So I had it all there, um, which thank goodness I did because I would not have I would not have been able to read. I can't read my handwriting 30 minutes later. I would not have been able to read it two years later, but I, I'd have that interview, I'd transcribe it. And not only 
would I then have the quotes accurately, but it would put me back in that moment I could hear, oh yeah, this is what I, I heard at that moment. So, that, so a lot of, I had tons of audio, and then the, the photos that I took were partly to document it, but it was partly, oh, I can go back and look, what did I see there? Um, so between some literal handwritten notes, some audio recordings, some photos, that's how I kind of had the, what I'd worked with. Um, so yeah, people say, how do you remember this? There's a quote in the book, it's, it's not just I remembered it, it was because I was, I was recording that interview, yeah. Yes? Uh, what is the single most wonderful experience? That's, that's almost impossible. It's like when I ask everybody their favorite. Um, um, yeah, I don't know that I can pick one. Um, you know, it wasn't even during this year, but we, we wrapped the Grand Canyon as a family um, shortly after my dad died. So that one, again, has this grief process. It feels like that was what my mom wanted to do. And wrap, I don't know if you've read, going through the Grand Canyon is just in the bottom of it. It's this magical experience that if you're doing it for, um, I think it was a week long trip, you know, the first day or so you're still immersed in or you're still bad. Pretty soon you're kind of just in the rhythms of the, the canyon, and um, there's moments when it's really hot, and there's moments when it's cold, but it's just it just feels this is where I am. And I'm I'm sometimes not good about living in the moment, but that kind of made me live in the moment. And I feel like that's what that year I was better about too. Um, so I don't know if I can pick a a moment from that year. There each each place had each of those 12 months had something that was very, very memorable. And even a place like Gateway where it, it did not, it was a challenge. That was definitely the most challenging of the parks being in the middle of New York City, noise, uh, heat. But there were some pretty memorable, special, beautiful moments there too. So, um, yes. Your next article is a TU. Yeah. Would you please describe all the parts you spoke about tonight? <laughs> <laughs> so we can, I mean, just a brief little snippet. So everybody to get to the page and have it. So describe all the <laughs> he, he would like to describe all the parts I saw. You're going to have to buy the book. <laughs> uh, actually, I think, I, I think at one point, they had me on the website. They didn't have me do. Here's, I don't think it was the 12 parts of the book. I think they had me do. Here, what's your top 25 parts? So you're back in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So the book, the book, yeah, the book I broke down is 12 months, 12 chapters. Basically, what I mean, I use that as the device for myself because it was partly. It's going to be too daunting if I gather all this stuff. How do I separate it? Um, that was kind of, a, I guess, in some ways a gimmick, but I also felt like it worked, you know, going through the seasons of a year. And um, it, but then when I wrote, I was supposed to write 80,000 words for the book. That was when I finally, and I wrote 150,000. <laughs> and I, I, this was new to me. I didn't, I, you know, I'm used to work for paper, and I asked, the, I had an agent, which was new to me. I said, is it okay that I wrote 150? And she said, Absolutely not. <laughs> we, you do not send that to a publisher. I said, so I cut it to 120, and she said, I said, is that enough? She said, absolutely not. So I got it down to 99,000, I mean, 99,000. She said, okay, let's send it to them like that. And then for the best phone call I got was, this is, this is fine. So I didn't have to cut another 20,000. But um, I just poured everything out, so there's a lot that didn't, that did not. <laughs> Mentioned in like half half of what I wrote. Uh, wow. Um, yes. What do you see as the biggest threat to the park going forward? Yes. What did what do, you, do I see as the biggest threat? And that was kind of one of the epiphanies that I touched on a little bit. That um, all these things that I thought about that maybe it was budgets or climate change or whatever such and such pollution. It, it was more. 
the idea of that connection of Americans to the park. Do do previous net future generations love the parks as much as my parents did, as much as I do? Because if they don't, then it, it, that was one of the things I, I think I felt like before this that you create a national park, it's it's preserved for eternity. You kind of lock it up and throw away the key. And kind of one of the epiphanies was that no, that that isn't the case. You kind of have these are places you have to fight for each day, again and again, and that will be forever. So if, if we all love them, if enough people love them, that's okay. But if, if people don't care about them anymore, that that won't happen. When I met with the Grand Canyon superintendent, he was rarely, relatively new to his job, and he said, you know, I've been he had been at all these other parks, and this was kind of a dream job. And he said, I've been handed the keys basically to one of the you know, greatest places on earth, one of the most protected places on earth. And he said, what do you think I do every day? I said, I don't know. He said, fight to protect it. Because um, he talked about how at that point, there were some something like 75,000 flights that were coming over, you know, tourism flights over uh, the Grand Canyon. Now they have no flying zone in the middle, but if you if you let the tourist those flights change, they would certainly fly over. You, you, know, you fight to keep that space quiet, to keep it free of those flights and keep the flights over here. The bottom of the Grand Canyon, there's the battle over the water. In between, there, there's so there's all these elements, and he talked about how basically the Grand Canyon is being attacked from a, a zillion different directions, and um, so his day-to-day -day job is to fight to protect that place. Um, so I think about that often. If, yeah, if, if you have to do that for the Grand Canyon, which is kind of self-evident is one of our greatest places, you probably have to do it for every day. Have you ever gone down to the uh, burrows? I have not done the burrows. I've gone, I've hiked down numerous times and um, hiked out of the Grand Canyon on the trails. And so you see the burrows all the time. But I have not, and I think that people say, "How oh, that hike isn't that scary?" I think being on a burrow would be scary, yeah. where I don't have the control. <laughs> yes. Have you seen how to survive in the I have not. I've seen the, the beautiful pictures of it. Um, the how to survive uh, Indian reservation. Someday I'd like to get there because it has amazing waterfall. Um, although that's a place I know that yeah, that's a, a, an interesting study in overuse and I think that for a while they were having helicopters go down but now they're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. But the water there's those photos of that it has this aqua water and it has, have you have you been there? Uh, I actually I think it's to go there it's 2020 but I got to uh, okay. Yeah it's just the, the the photos of it are stunning like other other world yeah. all right last question. Yeah. Um, Curious, how did your book, you write the book, because you had said that um, you used to camp when you were younger or growing up, but didn't. So, how did it affect your family? Do you think it drew them in to camp? I saw your daughter was on one. So I go, I've got two daughters the same age. I mean, right. Are they more, you know, like camping now? That's a really good question. My, even before this, my daughter, she's and wife. Both love theme parks, and I hate theme parks. <laughs> it's like my idea of hell is going to a theme park. So, um, and I think my daughter kind of planted the seed, kind of for this idea of back to the fellowship. She at one point said, you know, that when she was a little daddy, what's your idea of a of a a, a great theme park? Uh, well, your your theme park, your happiest place on earth. And I said, well, it's not a theme park; it's a national park. So I think I had that in my head because of her. So she did, she has now been to, and my wife, since this, they did not go on hardly any of these trips. But since then, we've gone to Acadia, um, and we we were up on top of Cadillac Mountain when there was this meteor shower that Mia still talks about. It was, it was like watching fireworks. Everybody, ooh, la, ah. Um, she's been to Haleakala, so she's been to the bookends of the park. She's, um, and I wouldn't say, I think if you gave her the choice tomorrow, do you get to go to Disney or to Yellowstone? She's going to say Disney. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think these places do sink in in ways. Um, I mean, I tell a story, and, and 
in the book about how I, my mom talks about, she'd have to bribe us with M&Ms on hikes if we were grumbling, you know, we hated it. And I think I wrote about that in the book, and there's a, a friend here who became a National Park Service ranger, and he went up, he was in Alaska for a while, and he's now in Arizona. His mom is, lives in Jackson, still lives in Jacksonville. She came to want to talk to him, she said, it's so funny, when he was little, he, he used to complain about being outside, and we do these things, we force him to do it, and now here he is, he's a ranger in Alaska. I think these, you do plant some of these seeds, and then I don't know that I was always happy. So I, give, I really give my parents credit for